Good morning. This is Jason Dean coming live at you again for another Film Fanatic show. Here it is. It is about uh, 9 o'clock here on a Friday. Hope everyone's doing good. Or I should say 10 o'clock Friday night, Friday morning. I need more coffee, I guess. Hope everyone's doing good. Thanks again for some of the new folks that have come on board. The, uh, the thing that's always super cool, I've had quite a few folks comment uh, again, lately on a lot of these videos, and and I love the uh, I love the interaction. You know, most of the folks out there that are have been subscribing to the channel have been uh, people I've never met before. So had some really cool, uh, interesting dialogue and communications with some of these folks. So uh, I really appreciate people commenting on these videos. You know, again, like I've said, I love to. I'm always brainstorming as far as trying to bring about some new ideas to this channel. I love, you know, I think variety truly is a spice of life. So I'm always trying to think of new things and new presentations, new, I've been doing some, I've done a few shows where I've covered franchises so I'm always trying to mix things up a little bit with all always for the most part the focus being on the, the exportation world but I love a lot of many different styles I, I love all kinds of styles all different genres and uh, you know I always want to bring variety I'm always uh, interested in in things when there's when there's a little bit of depth to it meaning like you know uh, examples for me when things sometimes certain things resonate with me or they might have some like uh, to a degree like lasting lasting power it might be something you want you might want to come back to or there's uh, some different shades involved. You know, certain bands that I really love. Obviously, movies that I that I love. Certain books. I love things that have a lasting power. But then you you can go back to it and you you have a different experience. And there's maybe uh, a lot a lot uh, a lot of layers to it. And you can kind of you know maybe to a degree like think of it as like an onion and you you know you peel back one layer and then there's another layer but i love when there's depth to certain things because i find when when it happens you know you at least from from my perspective you kind of you know revisit those things and you realize well maybe it's not entirely like a a, a one dimensional thing there's there's the 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 approach could be from many different facets to how that thing was created or what was put into that. So there's a little bit of depth to to what's actually happening or what you're experiencing. So a lot of those times it can be that, at least from my perspective, you'll you'll and I tend to just naturally gravitate towards things like that where it will further my interest and and I'll you know want to come back to it even more you know i think a kind of an example of that in, in in musical terms you know when i say when it comes to uh electronic music which is my favorite style just like a quick example that just kind of came to mind my favorite band of all time which i did a show on uh, a few weeks ago autecker this british electronic duo easily my favorite band of all time they're not you know your typical uh, band I guess per se but I consider them to be a band my favorite uh, my favorite artist of all time my favorite band of all time and definitely my favorite uh, electronic artist of all time so I like for example what those guys do and then another example would be say uh, a real famous another very famous electronic artist uh, 
Paul Oakenfold. Paul Oakenfold is actually like a pop. Pretty much, I kind of consider him a pop star. He's an electronic artist. He he's primarily known as being a, a DJ. He was kind of the the first like DJ artist that. I, I think really propelled the idea of what DJs are and that they could sell out arenas and, and be put in a, a context of like a rock concert. And it became, he was, you know, a pioneer in the way that he brought, I th I really think that he, he brought the term and the art of DJing, especially when it comes to uh, techno or house music, progressive house music. He, he kind of made it, I attribute to like all the things he, he's like accomplished. I attribute, you know, him making the, the term DJ or the art of DJing uh, like a household thing, a household name where across the spectrum, everybody knows what DJing is for the most part and is aware of it and has seen it. And it's become kind of a cultural uh thing of where it's like part of like a universal fabric of what you know like people identify the electric guitar with rock and roll i think he he did that for djs and where it, it, it he he brought it to the masses he also aside from being a dj he was also a producer of other people's records but he also was one of the first electronic artists to put out his own material he put out a bunch of records um i think he put out about two or three albums one in particular which i think is really a really great album called uh uh buka and that came out in the uh, early 2000s and it's an album that he that he basically wrote and performed himself and he was one of the first DJs, he's also from the UK, who broke from the fold to a degree of just straight up DJing and DJing, you know, meaning that he spent his whole career playing other people's tracks, doing remixes of other tracks, but never took that leap of where he was composing his own material. He was one of the first guys to kind of do that. But when I when I was talking about you know I naturally gravitate towards artists that have there's a lot of layers a lot of textures there's there's a a lot of different colors to their to what makes them what they are and I look at like Paul Oakenfold and Autechre as being definitely electronic artists but also at the same time worlds apart and and in some ways, polar opposite uh, and very very separate entities, even though they're kind of under that umbrella of electronic artists. Whereas, you know, Paul Oakenfold obviously does one, more or less one particular style very well. You know, house music, progressive house, techno, trance. Trance, he's probably most well known for ushering the term trance music which is, you know, um, kind of a, a branch of techno, early techno, that kind of preceded trance music and that ushered in, uh, was influenced by house music. But he does a, uh, a certain style very, very well. And it's, you know, it's like one of those things of if you're in the mood for that kind of music, it's, you know, you, you get what you, what you need out of it. And, uh, you know, it's essentially kind of party music. But you get... You know, he, he does a style, performs a style, creates a style that's very specific. And, you know, and I love that stuff, but to a degree, it's it's kind of one-dimensional. You know, it, it serves its purpose. It's really great. I love that music. I'm very much influenced by a lot of that music when it comes to my band, Quantum. But I look at Autechre as being, obviously, you know, true pioneers in the electronic world. But their music, I feel, has... A certain depth to it where they're pulling from lots of different areas and resources and electronic music 
and their music for me is like an onion where I get something out of it each time I listen to it and it can be I I I'll, I have that experience all the time well I uh, can listen to their album or albums you know numerous times and I'll get something different to it or get something different from it and it's because I feel like with them you know obviously they do fit that bill of dance music to a degree but they're they're also pulling from so many sources uh, and I think to a degree, even non-electronic sources, I think they have, you know, they're pulling sources, pulling inspiration from, you know, pure ambient music. And they're also pulling a lot from, say, uh, hip hop and rap music, especially old school hip hop. And they also have a very experimental age, uh, edge to their music, kind of almost avant-garde. But they have lots of colors, lots of shades to their to their sound and their whole presentation. So I get something out of their music all the time, and I can and I think it's because of that reason. Whereas like Paul Oakenfold, I can generally listen to that stuff anytime, but I find I find for myself I have to kind of be in a certain mood for that. I'm I'm not gonna just always pop in that kind of stuff. Whereas Altecker, because I feel like they have like an, like the the onion analogy there's a lot of nuances and there's a lot of un uh kind of almost to a degree unconventional influences and they have a very unconventional sound and there's a lot of textures going a lot of textures a lot of different shades and hues and uh, hues and colors that stuff i find i can put in autecker like any time of the day or any time of the night i don't really have to be in a certain mood and i attribute that to their to their broad palette of a sound. So I just naturally gravitate towards artists and music and things that have that, act as that, you know, metaphorical thing, you know, related to an onion. So with this channel, I try to do that too. I'm trying to, you know, always, obviously it has a, a certain kind of focus, whereas like the still the primary focus is you know, with the whole exploitation world. But I love lots of different things, so I'm trying to always bring variety and break things up so it never gets, uh, I don't know, monotonous or mm, to a degree predictable. So maybe, you know, the folks out there like listening to me, you know, blab on about these movies that I love and what they mean to me, you know, throw some interesting, uh, you know, just having more variety and and uh, not always being maybe not always being something that can be labeled or put into a box so i'm always you know thinking of new ideas i'm always thinking of new shows so i had this idea the other day and i thought this this would be kind of a cool thing and so this is going to be uh a new franchise uh, uh the coverage of a franchise Franchise might be a, a weird term to use, but I would say it's more of, it's a series of films based on a, a short story that I that I have always loved. It's a story I always go back to, and I've realized after, there was a movie I was watching the other day, and I realized, oh wait, there's, there's quite a few different versions of this short story. And they're they're all over the place. And I thought, oh, you know what? That could be kind of a cool thing. And I've and I've seen this sh short story referenced in certain films, so that could be an interesting angle and maybe an interesting idea for a show. And again, it's one of my favorite stories uh, of all time. I usually come back to it and read it. You know, uh, I almost read it like once a year or every couple every couple of years. And that is the most dangerous game. It was a, a a short story that came out in 1924. That is something like I said. I always come back to. Huge fan. Huge fan of the story. It's always been one of my. As a kid, I remember reading it, and it was one of the first. And I definitely consider it to be 
uh, horror based and it was definitely the first one of the first horror based stories I read my first literary introduction to horror was Edgar Allan Poe and I and I attribute at the source of it, of it all Edgar Allan Poe was the main person or figure that introduced me to horror I remember reading his stories as a as a kid even uh, in middle school and it was the first time I ever came across the, the genre of horror and shortly after that even before I, I had ever seen a movie and shortly after that I remember coming across the most dangerous game and the story the most dangerous game came out was was published in uh, 1924 and it was written by Richard Connell and again it's one of my all-time favorite stories it's one of the first horror stories uh, that I was ever introduced to as a kid it was a real pivotal story that got me really inspired and I just uh, kind of got bit by the bug at an early age uh, for all things horror obviously with Edgar Allan Poe there was always a, su a supernatural element to his stories so that was my introduction to horror first and foremost but also fantasy based horror whereas Richard Connell Connell's story The Most Dangerous Game is I think very much a horror based story but it's there has a a real element of reality set uh, it's really it's set into uh, you know into like a real life uh, reality scenario and it's more along the lines of things that actually happen and things that can actually happen and it's more uh, reality based it's not it's non fantasy based so it was a great uh, discovery when I was a kid and I was always always fascinated with the story it always really got under my skin and a, the basic premise of the story is that the story features a big game hunter from New York City who fa who falls from a yacht and swims to what seems to be an abandoned and isolated island in the Caribbean, where he is hunted by the Russian Russian aristocrat. Most famously known as Count Zaroff. And it's a short story, it's only a few pages long, but it's really intense and it's I think truly scary. And it really and I when I thought about doing this idea for this show, I realized there's like quite a few movies that are based on this short story and they run the spectrum and they're all pretty different from each other but I thought wow that's really cool it's something I've never really heard I don't really hear this story talked about that much you know it's it, it's very much in step and you know was part of my introduction to horror as a kid it's something I still revisit now even to this day and it's one of my all-time favorite stories and there was a, a version of the film that came out shortly after the story, not 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 all that long after the original publication. the The first adaptation of of this story, the most dangerous game, came out in nineteen thirty two, and there were two directors on board: Ernest B. Shosh, Ernest B. Shosdank and Irving Pitchell with the music composed by Max Steiner or Max Steiner it came out in 1932 so it was shortly shortly after the original publication which is really interesting and this this ad adaptation like again like I said there there's a few different adaptations of the story and and there this the story itself has been referenced in certain films and that's what kind of you know I I kind of came to this realization like that would be kind of an interesting thing to talk about and this first version that came out in 1932 is pretty much word for word scene for scene uh, a copy of the book it's it's pretty much an exact uh, replication of the original short story I I've seen this version from 1932. I've seen it a few times. I've probably seen it about five or six times. I have a couple of copies of the original short story. I have this really cool book that I got when I was a kid. That was the first time I came across this story, 
and it basically was a book that it was compiled by Alfred Hitchcock and it's it's comprised of all like short stories of horror horror stories and also suspense stories and these were all stories that uh, from Alfred Hitchcock's personal collection and he felt that these were really influential on him and he these were his favorite stories and one of those stories was the most dangerous game and that's how I discovered it and I have that still uh, it's a real thick hardcover book it's really great it's a beautiful edition really great illustrations and then I have one or two other copies of it also but that that particular edition is really awesome and that was how I discovered uh, the original story and this version that came out in 1932 is literally you know page by page it's it's a it's the closest rendition to the original story it's 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 pretty much exact and it's really great i've seen it like i said i've seen it about five or six times i saw it again last year and it really holds up it you know it came out in 1932 there there's a tremendous amount of suspense to to the film there is uh you know, I kind of look at this film as being almost like a an early rendition of like a a serial killer film or even a slasher film. And you know, the thing that's so interesting about this movie and the story is that it's very much uh, you know could be something that we see in the headlines today. You know, and it's and. You know, it kind of goes back to the idea that it's something that I've always thought that, you know, man itself, at, you know, himself as being a, a creature, you know, is capable of some of the most heinous acts on the planet. They're, you know, the human, the human experience, you know, throughout history shows that where, you know, man is capable of great feats of discoveries and science and also, you know, great works of, you know, this great works of art, creating great works of art or architecture or music. But then there, and, and you know, great uh, examples of love. But man is also capable of doing, you know, some of the most, you know, the, the most heinous uh, atrocities, you know, in, in the world. And I think that this, this story... I think the reason it resonated with me so much, even when I was a kid, and even now, is that it really, I feel, focus, it, it focuses on that dark nature of, of, uh, of man, what they are capable of doing as far as, you know, something that is truly evil. And so... It's so for me. It's something that's set very much in reality. It, it's it's very different than. Uh, it's not really to me. It's not a, a work of fantasy or. There's not. There's not your. There's no supernatural element to the story. It's it's basically the man itself is the monster. And what they're capable of doing, and I I just I've always felt that that's such an interesting kind of narrative and and a way to explore horror and the or origins of horror but then the, you know the full gamut of or or the psychology of what you know man is is capable of doing and i've noticed too there are all of these editions i just watched another movie which i'm going to do for my next show called Surviving the Game, again, which is pretty close to the story, but but this adaptation is so completely different in every way. And it's a, it's a, it's kind of a terrible low-grade or low-brow B movie. I kind of, that's, that's how I look at it. It's, it's really bad, but it's, but it's, you know, it's also kind of an awesome movie, but it's, you know, I th it's such an interesting contrast because the original film from 1932 is is an exact kind of replication of the story. 
and it's very serious, very dark. And this this other version that I just watched again last night, which I do own, and it's called Surviving the Game. It's all based on the same story, and it was you know done like sixty years later, and it stars Gary Busey and Ice T and Rutger Hauer, and the movie is so terrible. But I love it. It's it's great. And I consider it to be definitely like a B movie. But it's really terrible. And it was meant to be taken seriously, I think, when they when they made that movie. But it's uh there's there's certain things in that film that are kind of cringeworthy. But I still love it. And I thought, wow, like that's really interesting how this classic story inspired these two movies, but they're just so so different from each other. I don't own the original film from 1932 on on Blu-ray or DVD. I don't even own a copy of it. I think I might have it on VHS. It is something I want to get eventually. It would be really awesome to buy it on on um, Blu-ray or 4K. I'm sure there's an edition of it. But the thing that I really love about the original is how it really holds up. It really... I almost feel like watching the, Surviving the Game, like I watched it last night, that film is is super dated. It was done in the uh, early, early 90s. And it's super dated. It's super dated. Whereas the thing that's so incredibly surprising t- to me is the, the original from 1932 is way more timeless. I don't, I don't think it is, is dated in, in really any way, in a shape or form, which is so surprising. And I think, you know, part of it is because it, it is so close to the source material. And a lot of the times, you know, when stories are adapted, you know, when novels are adapted or short stories are adapted for the big screen, sometimes when that happens and there's, you know, like say an example, one example I think where it works and where it doesn't, Alan Moore's Watchmen classic comic book story really great you know just a classic you know that was a a real pivotal time in the world of graphic novels where suddenly you know Alan Moore was a real pivotal figure in the comic book world you know he also created V V for Vendetta and he was one of the first comic book creators that took the idea of what comic books could be and moved them into more of an area of where adults could really love love them also because they dealt with much more you know adult themed um ideas and 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 also uh, more more focused in in things that people were dealing with and suddenly comic books were a lot more serious they were taken more serious seriously they weren't looked at as just you know uh you know, serial, uh, you know, for the brain, or uh, suddenly the you know they weren't regarded as just these, you know, super silly stories with people in tights, and they weren't just you know, comic books were not regarded anymore for things that just kids could like, you know. So Alan Moore was one of those char- one of those writers, one of the first people in comics that ushered in this whole new era of where adults could read them too. And The Watchmen was one was I think one of those pivotal comic books or graphic novels where suddenly the themes were way way darker, way much more darker and they had a lot more weight behind them. So adults gravitated towards reading that you know that book also. And there was a uh, a f- big film, a big screen adaptation by Zack Snyder that came out, which is pretty good. I think it's pretty good. I sometimes have mixed things about that film. I do like it. Sometimes I like it. Sometimes I don't. I don't know. It's a mixed thing. But the thing that, for good or bad, the thing that about that film is Zack Snyder tried to say stay so exact and, and so close to the source material by Alan Moore's, you know, original graphic novel. So it's literally, you know, scene for scene, di- you know, even the, the dialogue is kind of taken from the comic books, but especially the, the structure of the story. 
it's you know he he intentionally set out to try to make it as close and as a replication of the source material and it's good but i don't know it's got there's some mixed things about it there's a there's a certain things about it that i feel don't really transmit so well on, onto the big screen but it so it's kind of mixed and but a few years back there was an hbo adaptation of the watchman and it's close to some degree to the original story by alan moore the essence is there but the story itself and the narrative is very very different and I think that that was a real successful uh, version of the story and, and of the novel because it's, it is very, very different. And it does do something really, really, you know, really unique. And I think that that series that HBO put out is amazing. It's, it's an incredible series. And I think for me, it's, it's the best rendition of that story. So, you know, it's pretty mixed, whereas, you know, like I said, with The Most Dangerous Game, the first movie that came out is so incredibly uh, focused on replicating the short story. I think it, it it's an example of where it does really, really work. You know, where Surviving the Game, which I'm going to do a show on next, is very much inspired, but very different. And not as successful it, it so it's an interesting thing when it happens but i definitely recommend i mean it's one of my all-time favorite stories like i said if you're into horror and suspense especially suspense based stories it's uh just one of the best and uh the the film adaptation from 1932 i think is is uh, awesome and it doesn't like i said it's not dated at i don't think by by you know uh by anything i considering it came out in 32 it's it's pretty wild how it still holds up and also the themes that that story is about about man being you know the kind of the most vicious creature on the planet any idea you know from the hunter the hunter's perspective being at the most dangerous game the ultimate prize you know in the in the idea of a, a person who's a who's a, a hunter is to hunt, hunt your fellow humans. Like, that's the ultimate prize. And I just think that's a real fascinating uh, premise. So this is Jason Dean. So stay tuned for what will be the next series of movies that are inspired by one of my favorite stories of all time, The Most Dangerous Game. So if you like this channel, please like and subscribe and keep the comments coming. Um, really enjoying this whole thing. So stay tuned for this hopefully new and exciting series. Peace.